board, Rachel Tedesco, John Lawler, Sherry Bates, Roy Gardner, myself, Kevin Riley. Uh, hearing is declared open, 7.01 p.m. Uh, we have a couple of items on the agenda this evening. Uh, there are no minutes. Uh, we do have uh, a um, Form A matter for 374378 Plymouth Street, uh, which is um, our Deputy Chief Windsor. Uh, Greg, if you want to come up, and, and Roy, if you want to, can you bring that up? How's our, how's our technology Great. tonight? Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get this sorted through. something loaded that was sent in connected to a go and they're working on it right now. Okay, there we go. That's the actual plan right there. Okay. Perfect. And uh, let the record reflect our member Diane Phillips uh, has joined us for the meeting this evening. Uh, Roy, comments on the uh, on the form A? Oh yeah, there was, there was a form A file. Larry Silver's a uh, engineering group filed that on behalf of uh, Craig Windsor for a what was an intended according to the application to be an estate lot at, at 388 Plymouth uh, there's actually two addresses involved and both of them are involved in that one of them is uh, one of them is 388 The two addresses um, in the plan are 374 and 378. Okay, anyway, uh, the intent was to create, a, in simple terms, a, a, a new buildable lot on the site. problem we ran into when I was reviewing the logistics behind that is that although it's extremely difficult to find and without having Larry Silver's plan in hand and <coughs> some deep dive assistance from the assessor's office uh, we did come up with a uh, we did two form A plans and I, I believe it's 1993 the office has that stuff right now they're trying to get it scanned enough so we can see it those two estate lots that created in 1993 uh, used the, uh, the maximum allowance of state lots on a parcel of land in East Bridgewater based under the zoning bylaw, the two that, that were created. The uh, reason it was difficult to find is that although we did sign a Form A plan here, that Form A plan was never recorded at the registry because it's a land court parcel. Form A was redrawn under land court requirements and then recorded with the land court. So the plan actually is is a, a plan of record that is recorded. But if you search through the registry of deeds, uh, you can't find it by address, which is one of the one of the flaws in the land court searching. So can, can I have those uh, those two sheets back? Mm -hmm. Are they on the on the? Are they up there now? Yeah, they should be up there. I tried like loading them like three different times. Thank you. Okay, so, so what's up there right now is the is a is an annotated uh, view of the 1993 uh, land court plan that created the two estate lots. There's a small 
what's, what's actually a legal buildable lot in the front, and there's an estate lot on either side of it. The, uh, the yellow tags are the references that I finally got with the help of the uh, assessor's office that give the, the land court plan numbers. So the, the, the difficulty we have is that uh, the land can certainly be uh, further subdivided and maintain those two estate lots in their legal form uh, under the zoning bylaw. But to create a, another lot, the only way we could create another lot, uh, given the physical shape and size requirements of the two estate lots, is through a one-lot subdivision, which would actually not look all that different from the plan that was submitted. But it's not a form A. Uh, it's not a form A plan. It's a one-lot subdivision plan. So I did try and pass that information back to Larry and asked that that Larry talk to. Uh, he did. To, to Craig about it just to make sure that it, it was clear what he needed to do. And I think after we went over all the documents, uh, and Larry did actually, while we were talking, was going through his file and said he did look at the uh, estate lot plan and or the, the, the land court plan, which is effectively the estate lot plan, and did agree that it was actually uh, prepared and recorded in, with the uh, land court in 1993. The cutoff date for the state lots, I believe, is uh, 1984. So it was done well, well after the estate lot cutoff date. So that's that's basically all I have. So <clears throat> it would appear that this then this application would want to be withdrawn and then resubmitted in a different form. Yeah, the suggestion would be that it be withdrawn without prejudice. And that all the fees be returned to the applicant, and that, and that, uh, when the actual form is a, a, a new, new plan has been prepared by the, uh, by the engineer, that it can be resubmitted as a one lot subdivision. Oh, I shouldn't say, one lot it should be resubmitted as a subdivision. It could actually be a two lot subdivision, but one new lot. But, yeah. Right now he's looking for one new lot. As as the as the uh, the currently filed plan shows. Questions? That that makes sense. The uh, so I'll start with the intent is um, I asked the engineer earlier today to withdraw the plan uh, in writing. He apparently did not do that. Um, so that's why I'm here tonight. I and that is the intent at this point. Uh, the amount of discussion you can have, I'm not really sure how much you want to discuss it. If you'd like to me to explain our thought process to get where we were or just withdraw it and go home. Up to you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, certainly if, if the new plan takes essentially the same shape as this, it's, um, you know, pretty, pretty understandable as to what's trying to be done here. I don't know if members have any particular questions. Um, if I, um, if it's allowable, I'll back up a little bit. Uh, just one, one point I think uh, we want to make clear. Right now we have uh, the existing 374, and we have the existing form A three-quarter acre lot on the street. With two, we have an existing house and a buildable lot. Uh, at the end of this um, project, the goal is the same. Uh, we will still have a buildable lot. We're not going to gain a lot through this. The overall intent, uh, the front half of 378 on that site we have one of the uh, ex uh, remains of the foundation of one of the first homes in the East Bridgewater. Oh, I was going to ask you just that, what that historical significance was. In 1973, yeah. my mother, who was one of the original secretaries of the Historical Commission, and Jane Haynes and um, uh, Mrs. Callahan, I believe, uh, all, they marked that site, and they actually did a, di a dig there and uh, recorded artifacts and things like that. Uh, so it was very important to her, uh, and she was actually able to purchase the site in 1986. They bought the eight-acre parcel um, that my lot was peeled off of. So the goal was, rather than sacrifice the entire buildable lot in the front, was to separate approximately a half-acre parcel that contained the important historic site, and just relocate uh, the home site to the two acres adjacent. 
So that's what this whole goal is to try to uh, preserve that site, which has absolutely no protection whatsoever. We can plunk a raised ranch right on that form A uh, as, we, as we see fit. Uh, and that was um, not considered in the 1993 subdivision. So we were attempting to do this. The goal was to do this as simple as possible and uh, felt that since 374 and 378 had never been under separate ownership, it still qualified as contiguous with a total of four and a quarter acres, four and a half acres between the two, so we just wanted to rearrange the lines. Uh, my lot was separated in 1993. I own that with my wife, but 374 and 378 have been contiguous since the dawn of time, and, and probably including one of the first home sites in East Bridgewater. So we felt that we were okay to uh, break that into an additional estate lot. Um, but um, Roy has, um, I spoke with Larry directly, and Larry agreed that the um, the one lot subdivision would accomplish the same through a, a few more hoops. All right, so um, just for, for quick point of reference, that's the that's an actual copy of the land court plan that created yeah. this that would be this front lot, which is a state lot one, and this real lot, which is a state lot two. Mm -hmm. So there's no issues with the size of the lot or the place of it, but just with the legality of it. Well, the, there's plenty of area there. The, the, a minor complication is that, that I'm sure long term, and it, I think it's clear from the plan in my discussions with Larry, is that, is that the two house lots, the houses, if we if we go back, that's how the houses are located. Yes. There's a common driveway that's used, which makes sense. It's basically a family compound. Okay, so that thin. Line, yeah, that in the this flight. this would would be the the access to the new lot, which would be cut off somewhere here. Oh, okay. I, I think I what he, what he's also trying to do is is to to get separate access to the real lot. There was going to be another another piece of land cut off of this existing piece that would allow you access to this real lot. So it would still retain its its legal description as an estate lot. It would still retain minimum forty feet of frontage on a public way. And it would still retain its its minimum two acres because right now it's it's what is it three seven five it's almost four acres. Yeah, it's about four and a half acres that's contiguous right now. We want to free up the half acre too. Um, so this this front well. piece here would be cut somewhere around forty feet this way, and a little bit off the back, a little piece off the back would go with this this parcel, okay. and yeah. leave roughly half an acre left, which is as is noted on Larry's original plan, the original form A. As a, as a historic site? Yeah, I've met with the Historical Commission and they agree it's a site of value and they are willing to um, take control of that um, under town ownership. Oh. The, the goal is it'll be donated to the town under the Historical Commission so they'll regulate it. Um, it won't be sold off or, mm. or whatever. Okay. Uh, again, there's absolutely no protection for this site. It's just something that was important to my mother. Um, mm. She wanted to give away the whole Form A lot, and we were kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of a lot. But, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, so we're just trying to move that value over to the left and um, not get greedy and bang in one lot. I have a, have a friend that's interested in a lot. He'd be a good fit for it. So, so there would be a, a, maybe a new building up on the upper left? Is that yeah, what you're if saying? You, if, yeah, if you could switch over to the plan that we initially presented it, it would show the ultimate um, okay. goal and we, uh, about three quarters of the way down, right there, yeah. Oh. We pop over to that, it would show the, uh, the ultimate goal and the, uh, the zigzag there. We knew we wouldn't be allowed to bring my estate lot into it to take that triangle off in this plan. Yeah. So the intention was to do that as a land swap later on to straighten the lines out. That's why we have that parcel B, I think he calls it, that small parcel off the rear that would um, be attached to my lot to maintain my two acres after uh, a land swap to get rid of that triangle, keep the frontage nice. Okay. Um, so so I, th I think to try and be clear, the, 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 the new lot that's yep. getting created would enter here. Yep, 65 this, feet or so. We'd have 40 so for the existing 374. Would be the future access at some point to the back house. 
Yeah, probably sooner rather than later, because uh, that's going to go uh, outside the family. Okay. Uh, as is the uh, the other parcel. So. Okay. And then the 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 access to the to the front house or to the front estate lot, I, I would expect would remain the same where it is. Yeah, my my there's no changes proposed to mine. My my lot's not part of this part of this proposal, other than uh, a land swap to clear that little useless triangle off and straighten out the frontage. That would be phase two of this proposal. Uh, on the if we go the one lot subdivision route, we'd probably be able to do that all in one sweep. Pull yeah. that triangle off of mine. Do everything keep a nice the straight same line time. there. Yes. And then we'll come in. We just kind of model it. They're, they're all over the place. That there's plenty of. Um, References on these one lot jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the one behind me, Whitmore Lane, is a one lot. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that's fairly recent too. So I did a. Uh, we peeled a small triangle, a small, um, whatever, fifteen fifteen hundred square foot piece off of the back of my lot when they did Whitmore Lane, so they could get the building square in there. That's why the line's a little funny on the oh, bottom, over there. Oh, okay. bottom yeah. right corner. That yeah. was so they could fit Whitmore oh, Lane in there. Okay. Um, he needed the building square. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're at. Uh, back to the drawing board, literally, and um, and we'll come back. Uh, Larry has a pretty good idea what we need to do. So um, a request of withdrawal at this point. So Steve. one uh, kudos for the uh, idea of, of of you know the protection of that um, historic site. Uh, two, we'll treat Roy's um, uh, earlier uh, discussion as a motion to uh, accept withdrawal on the form A application without prejudice uh, and either return. Uh, all fees to the applicant or to allow those to be applied to a new submission uh, for a, uh, a, a subdivision plan. Uh, second to that motion? I second that. Motion is made by Mr. Gardner, seconded by Ms. Tedesco. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of that motion, so signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed? Unanimous vote of all regular members present. Thank you, sir. Thank we'll you. see you again. Thanks, Craig. We will. Uh, next meeting will be April 1, April 15. Right? April 1. <laughs> April 1. All right, thank you. April is, that, is that a good day to have a meeting April 1st? Sure. <laughs> April yeah, that way if you don't like the plan, I'll just say <laughs> April 1st. <laughs> That's right. That's the only one in April. Okay. Have a good night. Thanks, Greg. Have a good night. Thanks, Greg. That actually First and the fifth. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, we've done that. 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 Yes, Okay. Uh, yes. Being 715, Hi. we invite our friend on the master plan to come up and. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Laurie Muncy. I work with Old Colony Planning Council. Okay. Rhiannon is double booked tonight, so I'm oh. here in her place. Well, there you go. Um, I have a little handout for you. Okay. Um, you. It gives you an update of what's gone on so far and a list of questions that we hope to get answered from you Thank so you. that we can keep moving along in this plan. Thank you very much. No problem. Okay. We'll share. We'll share. I have yeah. another oh, my. That's OK. That's fine. I have. Oh, sorry. So actually. I might need to share. I thought I had made extras, and I'm short one copy. You know, I can give it back to you when you're done, though. Oh, do we need more copies? I can make more copies. I, I just need you one. You can take Roy's. I'll give Roy mine. Yeah, that's amazing. So far, yeah, 746. Yes, yes that's really good for a town this size. Um, as you can see, what we've got done so far, um, the first two of three meetings, the steering committee we've met a few times, the survey, and um, the interviews with all the departments have been conducted. I think that's probably why I'm here with you tonight and you're doing your interview, but the staff has been talking to 
everyone. Um, right now, everybody's writing their chapters. I think um, Rianne's going to get you the clusters of chapters at a time for review and comment. Then we'll go to formatting, and then we'll come in for listening sessions and finish it all up once <coughs> we wrap it up at that point. Today um, are the questions at the bottom, and that's what concerns the planning board. Um, I don't know if which is a better format to go through this, if it's something that you want to take home and deliberate, or if you already know and you can just rattle them off. I can hear, I'm here to jot them all down and get them into the chapters. So if we can just go one by one. What consumes most of the planning board's time? I'm assuming you do a lot of form A's, small subdivisions, but what carries the bulk of your time? Special permits, probably. Yeah, probably special permits. And are they often for a particular cause? Like uh, our, the, the zoning bylaw here is, is sort of written in a, in a unique, well, I won't say unique, but an interesting, an interesting way, shall I say, um, where most of the zones, um, if you go through the, the bylaws, are, um, uh, you know, would have a series of allowed uses, disallowed uses, and special permit uses. Mm -hmm. The special permit uses being those that the planning board considers to be um, consistent with other uses in the district. So a lot of the time what we're seeing is those kinds of things coming in because there is not a lot under allowed uses, it's, they're, they're sort of very general and sparse. So, um, you know, things are coming in for those reasons uh, more toward the, the ultimate use question than anything else. So like site plan review, you do a lot site of site plan, plan review. Site plan review, you know, it, it's either permit. coupled with the special permit or it can be independent in some cases. And are they mostly commercial permits or for the most part? And what are the current goals and wants of the board? Anybody have particular thoughts on that? Sometimes called priorities. So let me let me let me kind of add on to Kevin's comments that that I think address both one and two. Mm -hmm. uh, the zoning bylaw we have it now is basically for all intents and purposes, effectively rewritten in 1987, shortly after we completed the current master plan, uh, which is actually dated 86 and 87, <laughs> as I'm sure you've noticed. Has it been updated since no. it has not been updated? Uh, we've we've twice, twice started to try and update it and really didn't see any serious need to do that since there's no major differences in the, in the structure of the town from the, I believe it was 11 geographical areas that had been outlined in the 1987 master plan. They still look pretty much the same. Yeah. Okay. And what we did at that point in time is we took old colony planning council's advice and, and when we made some, let's say, structural changes in that in, in virtually all of the districts we used pretty much the structure that, that Kevin had just mentioned. And that is that we had a list of allowed uses a list of specially permitted uses, and those those typically are all in the commercial districts. Yeah. The, the residential districts tip, tip, typically only have allowed uses listed and prohibited uses. And in, in the residential districts, they're, they're pretty much defining as allowed those things that are, that are defined as residential within each of the individual districts, which is based pretty much on, on the type of residence, single family, two family, multifamily, so on and so forth. There is special permit requirements for multifamily units, and, and those requirements are basically limited on determining that access, egress, and parking is suitable to, to serve multi, you know, multifamily uh, areas. The, the, the trouble we started to r run into in, in 87 when we were rewriting the bylaws, we wanted to avoid adding 100 pages to it, like you see in some of the bigger cities where virtually every single commercial type use you have is listed individually. Yeah. And every requirement for those commercial type uses is listed individually. 
and the table for things like access, egress, and parking and all of those takes up dozens, if, if not hundreds of pages in, in bigger zoning bylaws, typically cities. Right. But some of the towns actually have it that way. Yeah, that's Every true. single potential use, literally from A to Z, yeah. has, has requirements. So what we did, based on the fact that, as I'm sure you've already realized, is we don't have an awful lot of, of high-end commercial uses in the town. We treated everything under 10,000 square feet that's an allowed use can just go get building permits. Everything over 10,000 square feet in the, in the commercial uh, zones, both industrial and business, well, over 10,000 square foot building implies there's some kind of intensity of use. So those we treated the special permit so we could see parking requirements and actual use. What was the real use of the building going to be? So, so we could look out in, in the, the general standard usage categories that are available. And most architects and engineers have those these days to see what kind of parking and things we would have. So one of my thoughts would be it would be nice if, if in a, a revision to our zoning bylaw, we could find a way to better define uh, access, egress, and parking needs so that we wouldn't end up with, with uh, very, very limited amount of in bylaw parking requirements and require virtually every applicant in the, in the business district to come tell us what he's going to do. That's not um, a new thing, actually. Um, everyone's kind of re-looking at their parking regulations, and not only in commercial, but also residential. Yes. So um, definitely want to look at that. I was at the C CPTC oh, seminar this weekend. This weekend yeah. And that was one of the things that was discussed. Yeah, it's a big thing now, um, reducing parking requirements so that we don't end up with acres of asphalt, like the old malls. That end up to be stormwater, you know, nightmare at the end of the day. The, the problem is you have to dance that that somewhat fine line of we want enough parking and we don't want, want a lot of extra, but we want to make sure that when Christmas enough is, Christmas is regularly comes, enough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I which think is which is a difficult dance to do. I think the balance from people from our generation is we remember the malls. Remember the Christmas parking, and remember, but now shopping and all of that has changed a lot. Where, you know, we're, the malls are gone for the most part, and we have different ways of buying. And so, yeah, that's why we need to look at: Do we need ten thousand spaces for everyone to shop at the same moment of the day? <laughs> now, unlike my friend here, I am an attorney by trade, and I come from you know, the experience of many communities where things are set out in more detail in zoning bylaws, mm -hmm. uses. And I sort of prefer that. I don't want 100 pages, but at the same time, I want more definition than what's, than what we have. And I understand, you know, what okay. Roy's yeah. saying and why, you know, it was done. But I just find the other approach to be a little bit more uh, useful. The other thing I would say is, the, really, Roy, the only thing we see residentially is a is a, uh, a form A or a subdivision. We don't have a, the way that the bylaws are structured. Most everything else, you know, in terms of any sorts of relief, would go to the ZBA. So um, ZBA would take care of ADUs. Um, do you have that accessory dwelling units in town? Yes. You have that by right or by permit? Uh, I've never looked at it on a you on a uh, residential basis, but all of that. We do we do have that, and and. We just adopted it a couple of years ago, and I'm not going to be able to tell you whether that was done through the planning board or the, the zoning board of appeals without actually checking the bylaw real quick. Yeah, we'll check it too. But we do we do have accessory dwelling units in town now. Yeah, that's good. And they are treated as, and I think what we actually call them is expanded family unit, and the intent is is that they be limited to family occupancy. That can become challenging when. Occupancy and ownership changes as far as monitoring for a town's perspective like they're not going to come in and tell the, the permitting official, you know, my son has, you know, moved and got married and left the in-law that I had for him. Now, can I rent it out to a college student that I might not be related to and towns that had the requirement for the family restriction. They can get some challenges. 
Yeah, I'm, in, I'm looking at one of those now because. Yeah, just as FYI. We're looking at a potential future in law at my daughter's house in Foxborough for us. And, then, and they have a 10 page bylaw for their yeah. ex expanded family unit. And unfortunately, people put a lot of money into these units when they, you know, permit them, they construct them, and then they use them. Maybe they have an elderly parent who lives for nine years, and then the mortgage is 30 or 20 or 15. They really need someone to move in and, and recoup that investment. So that can be a constraint to a lot of people, but that's just something to okay, think so about. Okay, so give us some suggestions from O'Connell Planning Council's wide background as to how we could grant a, a, a second living unit within a single family home. We have constrain it, constrain yeah. it for some length of time to a family member. We don't really, um, we like I said, we don't really encourage people to. Uh, right, so to it doesn't work in East Bridgewater then. Yeah. Because we, we don't want we don't want three thousand two family homes in, yeah. in the town of East Bridgewater. Wouldn't it, first of all, if we were to present it that way at town meeting, it wouldn't it come close to getting enough votes. Number one. <laughs> yeah. Because no, we I tried several different things on this, and we finally got it passed when we 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 constrained it tightly to a to a family family member only and it can't be commercially rented a lot of people constrain it by size because you know they're usually a lot smaller than a regular apartment or dwelling unit so that kind of prohibits who can live there but yeah it's something we can give you some options to look at and, and consider um, a lot of towns they try to regulate it by affordability and place affordability restrictions for deed restrictions on the deed that goes with the property. So, you know, there's several ways to get around it. And the state also has their own thinking on it. They're talking by right now, and they have a template out to show that perspective. So there's a lot of ways to, to get there. It's just how, what's most comfortable for the community. Oh. A short answer is we do have. That's good to know. By law. Yeah, at least you have something it's in got place. Some constraints on it. How enforceable those would be long term? I have no idea. How you would enforce them long term? I have no idea. And that's the that's the hard part is you're putting a restriction on that you know can have limited enforceability, and well without a little bit of intrusiveness. But that's up to you. As 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 the chairman noted. Uh, we, we could have a signed covenant recorded at the registry, which is actually what the town of Foxborough does that we're looking at right now. Yeah. In the town of Foxborough, you actually have to tear the kitchen out. Yeah, I, I've seen so many configurations. And a lot of people, like, they'll fight back with the cultural. I've seen, um, you know, like some cultures have the... Extended family. Two kitchens. Yeah. The upstairs kitchen that we don't touch and the downstairs kitchen that we do touch. So it's just on how you want your town to look. Did you have more, Mr. Riley? That I, I, I didn't really get your whole um, thought. Uh, so, you know, I, that's, that's what I, you know, in terms of, of, of use and, and such, uh, I think that would ultimately make our job a little bit easier. Uh, and I think it would make for more consistency across, you know, the town. The other thing that you know personally uh, I think needs attention is the the Route 18 corridor itself. Just in terms of kind of um, right now, it's sort of a mishmash of of different zones and such. And I think that you know just an idea as to how that would play itself out, and, and probably more particularly <coughs> going north from the center out to the Whitman line. Um, you know, it's a mix of residences, offices, large office building, um, you know, you've got new housing that will be coming in. So, you know, just to kind of work that through. Any other comments, thoughts, guys? Um, Diane and I are new to the, to the planning board. Oh, you so joined? Yeah. Oh, okay. As of July, so we're just, I'm yeah. just learning. Awesome. Um, presume the same is true for Diane. Uh, but one of my concerns is the balance of, um, you know, I, I think we, we do need more housing in Massachusetts, definitely, and af affordable housing. So, but I'm also 
um, concerned about a balance that so our, our um, natural resources are also protected at the same time, that we don't overbuild in a sensitive area. So, um, you know, I, I, I certainly uh, applaud the, the state uh, for pushing for more development. I think it's needed all over, so. Yeah, for sure. The rents are crazy. The rents. Mm. And it's not yeah. us that are really suffering. It's my kids and our kids and their yeah. kids. Mm -hmm. The, yeah, I couldn't even tell you what my job is paying. <laughs> and yeah, I keep yeah. saying, oh, you should probably move home. <laughs> but yeah. not. Yeah. So you'd, you'd build a second unit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, well, I have one for my dad oh, already. Oh, right. But yeah. I have him in a little tiny house. Mm, and yeah. I was fortunate to have that. And the, it works out so well because he's a little bit dementia already. Yeah. So, so he's 90 feet away. Yeah. yeah, it's so perfect. Yeah. I, I don't know if this is one of our goals, but I, and I, correct me, um, but I know our board is over, overworked, and, and, and have you not talked about having a, a town planner or brought that up? Is that something that would fit as a goal for our looking? Because you have looked at that in the past. Could probably be our number one goal, actually. Yeah. We need a town planner in town. We, we actually had a, a, a salary for, well, let's see, a salary slot approved at town meeting. It was either two or three years ago, maybe even four years ago now. Mm -hmm. uh, but that salary slot w was way below what any uh, credentialed planner would be willing to take, as we found out after the fact. And there's a shortage right now, like incredible. Yes. Mm -hmm. Incredible, incredible. Uh, from, from what I gathered at our, at our session uh, Saturday up in Worcester at Holy Cross, uh, the small group of planners that, that were sitting at the table that I was sitting at uh, have all changed jobs in less than three years for lucrative uh, advances to other positions, and they're already being solicited by other communities at even higher salaries. So uh, there's... there's not enough planners in, in, in a lot of communities, especially in southeastern Massachusetts. A lot of our small towns never had a planner. Mm. And then our region especially, like I, we have it at, in the office, the actual numbers, but it's like maybe half our towns don't have planners. Mm. So we kind of fill in the gaps, but we keep yeah. encouraging everyone to. <laughs> Go into that field. So, so, so some kind of wording in there. Yeah, and oh, no, it'll definitely would, be in there. Would, would imply a town of our size with the, the, the long-term growth and, and things like that that are expected in, in the future. We really need someone, a professional, doing that. Yeah. With all the federal money, because I am working on, when I leave here tonight, a federal applica application. And let me tell you, it's not fun. And it's yeah. due on April 1st. They always give you, like, this little tiny window of, yeah, yeah. and ask for 50 pages of stuff. So with all that opportunity out there, you'd probably get your money back really quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, so in grants. In, in grant money, yeah. investment and opportunity. Right. right. Hmm. That's interesting. That's so number three was, are there bylaws that you feel need updating? <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I, obviously a few. Um, but this question in particular has to do with repetitive CBA applications, and I'm not sure if you guys would be the right people to answer that, but oftentimes, um, especially setbacks, um, or it just depends on the community, but sometimes they have outrageous setbacks 50 foot from the front or something ridiculous, and people want to put the house 25 feet, and they're always going for a variance, every other applicant. So it's a waste of time for everybody and resources to send all these people to ZBA for a variance that 95% of the time you're going to give. So are there... Except legally they can't. Legally they can't grant them. But every, I know a lot the way of towns it, just grant them out of hand. So some towns grant no, none. Some are very, very hard, and others are giving them out like candy. And the way the law reads, no one really should be getting them, like for uh, the most part. Absolutely. Technically, absolutely. <laughs> so I have always said we need to look at the law, or but that's not going to happen. So 
always look at the municipal level at first and see if there's some kind of adjustments we can make to your zoning bylaws where you won't have 25 applications in front of the ZBA for a setback or I don't think they ever see a setback re re request I, I know twice in, in it's been a long time now but over the, over the last eight or nine years there's been a couple where they wanted to put a porch on the front of a house and the, the house was already set at the setback line. Yeah. I, I think both of those, if I remember correctly, were granted, but. No, if anything pops up when you're kind of perusing around, or I'm sure um, Rhiannon will contact ZBA and ask them for their opinion as well. Um, but just while I'm here. We, we do actually have a 50 foot setback requirement for most of our single 50? family homes. <laughs> Is there 50? But, but, but to put that into context, the. Our single family homes have to be on 35,000 square foot lots and there's a building square that you can fit theoretically if you were going to go crazy within the building square that's within the setbacks, you could fit a 10,000 square foot house. So, I mean, there's, there's really no reason, um, unless it was constrained by wetlands or something like that where you, you, you'd want to worry about the, the front setback. But A lot of the planning schools are kind of, depending on where you're working, they're trying to get people back from the back deck into the front porch again. I don't know if you've heard that kind of technology, yeah. but yeah. yeah, because- What's the reasoning for that? For a generation, well, before me, let's talk about my grandmother's generation. Everyone had front porches. Along the street? Mm -hmm. Along the street, they sat oh, there, yes. they socialized, they socialized. watched their neighbors. Mm -hmm. Then the generation moved to the deck in the back of the house. Yeah. No one's talking to each other anymore. You're, mm -hmm. you're you know, you back away from, so now it's more dense, push them up forward, more walkability, more sociability, that right. kind of, just kind of look rethinking. There weren't a thousand cars an hour going down the street in your grandmother's time either. Yeah, though. and you right. know, back then we had the schools on every corner, it seemed like, especially when you were Catholic and you took the nuns, so the Catholic schools everywhere, so we all walked, but then, you know, we came a bus generation later with mega schools. And, and I think part of the communities of, of rethinking 3,000 person schools and, you know, more walkability. So just a, a little seed to plant mm. if it's interesting. But I, I personally love front porches. I think they're attractive. Mm -hmm. But I have a deck too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> both deck. of them. Are there any zoning changes you'd like to see over the next 10 years? Other than the MBTA district that we're working on right now. You and everybody else. <laughs> I, think it, I, I think given the town where the town is built out to, uh, the, amounting, the amount of land remaining that's buildable Other than some of the commercial and industrial stuff, especially along the Route 18 corridor, uh, I think what we could do on, on, the, on the residential side would be very limited because I, I think it would, it would look, maybe this is overstated, but I think it would look too different from the existing development in town, which is, uh, I think OCPC had told us, I'm thinking a decade or so ago now, that, that, that roughly, 68 to 70 some odd percent of the buildable land in town is built on. Now, that's based on the fact that we didn't have a municipal wastewater system and, and, and we have significant issues with, with Title V systems in our town, high groundwater, uh, low, right. low ground yeah. flow and, and stuff like that, so. Yeah. Uh, but just recently when the high school was built, actually I say recently, it's almost 10 years ago now, <laughs> give or take. Uh, we had a municipal plant put in to handle the high school. It's got a it's got a package plant, thirty thousand gallon a day package plant, with a space in the building and piping capability for a second thirty thousand gallon a day package plant, which was intended to be used primarily for the for the town buildings, the school, and then the downtown area, which we'd like to see rebuilt. Now, certainly, if we could come up with some kind of uh, well thought out uh, zoning plan for downtown that 
would take into account the fact that municipal storage is available. Uh, that would be a good thing. Uh, part of our discussion on the MPTA zoning is that uh, we have been contemplating and haven't decided yet, but we may have two districts in the MPTA zoning bylaw, one of those being downtown. It doesn't exactly meet the state description of what they consider downtown because uh, what they really want to see in their grand view of how all of that thing should work is that the, the downtown area is the area centered around the station. <laughs> well, we don't have one. We don't have, in yeah. fact, our downtown is roughly equidistant as far away as you can get from all five of the stations that are in our, quote, abutting towns. Yeah. Two in Brockton, Bridgewater, Hanson. Uh. I know, I feel for towns like this and Plimpton, who, you know, they're tiny, teeny, tiny and wet. They can only, you know, they're just so constrained by the soils and, you know, the water tables. But we have, the last piece of that is we, we do have a current signed intermission agreement with the city of Brockton to provide municipal sewerage in the industrial land uh, north of Grove Street all the way to the Whitman line. So that roughly starts at Compass Medical Center and goes all the way to the Whitman line. That's the intended area that would be mu municipally sewered. That's also the major area that we're looking at uh, to zone as part of the MBTA zoning district. And that's the new line you're getting, right? That, or is that an existing line? No, it's not there right now. Yeah, it's the new line. In the design the process. I think since we started negotiating that, this is probably now, probably year six. Mm -hmm. We actually signed an agreement with them, I believe now two years ago. Yeah. Engineering was, initial engineering was pretty much completed about a year ago. We, we committed money at our previous annual town meeting, three or four million dollars, I believe. Yeah. We have a grant, I'm thinking it's around three or four million dollars as well which if we don't vote in the MBTA zoning district, we may not get, but, but that's, that's, that's for discussion at another time. Oh, uh, it doesn't mean it's gonna get built. Well, we, <laughs> right. you, you know the sewer line will get built. <laughs> well, it, there's, there's significant reason, you know, why we need that, obviously. Yeah. Compass Medical Center, I assume you know what that is. It's a, well, it's not Compass anymore, but. Yeah. <laughs> They're all sig changing. Signature, signature, signature Medical Center. Yeah. Uh, that has one of the largest Raised septic systems in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Oh my goodness, I didn't know that. It's, it's, it's close to this. It looks like a football field, oh and it's like 10 feet above the ground. It's a Title V system. It's because it's medical. I'm sure they had to have. It's got other things yeah. with it. it. It's got a bunch of chambers in front of it and stuff like that, and oh. whatever else is required because it's a medical building. But, yeah. Yeah. but they don't have a municipal sewer system there. Mm. I think, I think Equity Industrial Partners, which owns that entire parcel, had looked at putting in a, a package treatment plant there, but part of the problem there is, is the, the uh, low permeability of the soil and the high groundwater table. Yeah. Not so a even, a, even a package treatment system with, with in-ground disposal, even deep injection in-ground disposal would be a problem because the water table is just, just under the surface. So that municipal sewer system, uh, you know, through the city of Brockton is, is, a, is something that we've actually been working on for almost 30 years, but it got real serious again about six years ago. In, in part because Brockton was forced by the state to get their stormwater out of their, out of their sewer system. Helps. And clean up the sewer system itself in terms of how it operated. And, and, and that created a, a effectively a bunch of additional capacity that they didn't have before. Well, they had, but they were using it, running clean water through their system that was infiltrating uh, coming from storm water, but. Do you have any other changes you'd like to see before we go to the next one? No, okay. Um, how will the ongoing population increase in town impact your work over the next 10 years? <coughs> I, don't, 
don't think it's uh, going to change significantly. I didn't think it was that significant. I mean, I'm sitting here going, well, I have to look at that data. I have it in my I computer. It was a decrease but in population. Yeah, I didn't think it, it like was. A um, yeah, I think maybe she need, meant it's something. It's been pretty consistent for the last 30 yeah. years. I didn't see it. There was that jump. big bump in, in 19... Uh, Back when everyone was 1980s, building. 1980s, let's yeah. say the 1980s. Mm -hmm. But since then, the, the additional units on, a, on an average yearly basis have been pretty consistent for pretty much an entirety mm -hmm. of the, the 30 years since then. Since, uh, mm -hmm. What would you like to see from the master plan? Like, do you have a goal, like the main goal for the planning board, or three main goals that you'd like to see, or is there a vision um, that you have that you'd like to encompass? I'd, I'd like to see some creativity and guidance as to what a, what an outside planning group sees in our town that could potentially be done that that let's say doesn't appear to fit in the current zoning structure that we have mm -hmm. I, I think our current master plan as old as it may be pretty much defined what I defines what our town looks like which, which I think it did then and I think it still does because I, I don't realistically other than the, the growth in the years the town has not changed very much the population has increased the town is still 90 plus percent residential still 85 give or take a percent or two uh, single family homes uh, that basically hasn't changed since 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 my wife and I moved to town in, in 1979 it's still I, I if you took a graph of percentages I don't think they've changed at all in 40 years yeah it's kind of consistent if, even the Hockamock Swamp sign there. Hockamock Liquors, I think that's been there my whole life. Like <laughs> <laughs> the same one. The things, same sign. I love it, though. Things typically don't change a lot in yeah. East Bridgewater, historically. Anything else you would like to I mean, I think, I think that, you know, it will be nice just to have something that is out there that everybody can get on board with and, and have the same vision for, you know, how things should be developed and how they should look um, because I think now there's some separation <coughs> in that and um, you know I think I think this would be a good aid in, in, um, in you know, kind of bringing that back together and, and getting everybody marching in the same direction that's a tough call lately <laughs> yeah yeah no that's that's true but it, you know it's, mm. I, I we'll think do our best no, but I think I think with you know experience that I've seen in other communities, I mean I think that is it, it having that becomes an important tool that you know okay hey the town has invested X amount of resources into this plan if we're not going to follow it why did we bother you know so create a sense of community with yeah. it too this yeah. is what we yeah. leave for our children and how we hope mm -hmm. to leave them a better place. Mm -hmm. And what can we do to help you Im to implement the master plan? I know suggesting a planning person, for sure, town planner, would help a million bit. Um, but what else can we do? I think, uh, like, looking at what we have and seeing, making those suggestions will be helpful. Like, do, uh, are there any gaps that we have? And looking 10 years forward, things are going to change. <coughs> Technologies will change, so we need to be current in that approach. And... Um, I don't know if you have that crystal ball to look 10 years forward. I always Will think it change that much or maybe we're fine. Oh, I, when you think 10 years back, mm. how much we've changed and, and just the pandemic has changed yeah. us. But I think the way to address something like that would be at least yearly reevaluation of your, your goals, your strategies, what you've done to get to those goals and strategies. And, and look at them, are they still important? If not, do we need to you know, readdress them or revise them? But at least it keeps everyone focused on the topic. If you had um, meetings with the department heads every year so that they could report out to you on what they've done with their sections, whether it's you know, open space or highway department or whoever you, know, you have in front of you, 
make a plan so that it's an active document and not something that we refer to occasionally when we're forgetting to what we were thinking about. Um, but if it's part of a work plan and someone has responsibility, like if everyone has a role but there's no leader, then it's it never gets done. In, in municipal government, we can all go like this, and oh, we get town meeting, and we get taxes, and but if somebody's job is to look at this once a year or every six months or whatever the town thinks is appropriate, and set up a procedure for reevaluation implementation, that's kind of what we I can mirror something from the HMP language when we were writing those last year because that's a federal requirement by FEMA that when you do a hazard mitigation plan it has to be an active plan and has to have somebody's name on it and they have to sign that they've done X Y and Z and we've even had like template reports included in there so we can look at something like that if that's a help mm, that that makes sense. Sense. yeah, yeah. Other questions, comments? Yeah, we're going to find a way to make East Bridgewater a destination and bring business into it before we do anything else. You know what I mean? We're rearranging the deck chairs of the Titanic. That's what we're doing. I don't think we're going to sink. I'm sorry? I don't, I don't feel we're sinking. I didn't say we were sinking, but we just, I've been here for 44 years. Yeah. Nothing's changed in 44 years. Mm. Go through the center of a town, it's not kept up anymore. Why? Other, other towns come and they say, well, let's put flower pots out front. And if, as long as the business owner will water them, we'll provide them, we'll take care of them, this or that. Do something. I totally agree. Sure. Do something to make it look like we care. Oh, yeah. I, I went to Chicago. The mayor stopped at my friend's house and he says, buy me a cup of coffee. I'm going to make you a lot of money today. He bought every piece of property he had. But he did that. He painted the ash barrels for people. They'd come around, they'd pick them up, they'd paint them, they'd put the flowers out. What do we do? My, my business is in Middleborough. Every year they put out flowers. The deal is if you water them, we'll, we'll, we'll put the, the plants out there. We'll put them up, we'll hang them up there for you. Mm -hmm. We've got we to gotta get together and do something. I care about this town. I've been here 44 years. I've seen different parts of Boston. I see how, how they deteriorate, and I've seen other parts that grow. Let's agree on something. So maybe streetscape improvements or Absolutely. something like I, that? I, I totally second that. Joy. And facade? Absolutely. Um, Let's make it worth the business owner's while, while to put a, a, paint, a coat of paint on their building. Kind of take pride in your community. You have to, because yeah. otherwise you get nothing. If you don't care about your town, neither does anybody else. Mm -hmm. And do you have areas in town where you'd like to see a particular character? Um, like a form-based code where all the buildings on this street Let me tell you what I was going to do 30 years ago. Across from the post office in this town, the Bob building inspector was Bob Lundberg. I brought up a, a set of plans, and I said, I want to make the, I want to buy that land across from the post office, and I want to put in buildings that the facade looks like Disney World. Downstairs was going to be fishmongers, cobblers, and upstairs was going to be a guild. And you know what he told me? He says, you'll never get anywhere with it because it'll be talked to death and the lawyers will get all the money. And that's exactly what happened. So I went and I bought a building in Middleborough. Broke my heart to move out of, out of East Bridgewater, but I did. So you got to get some people with some foresight to sit down <coughs> one time only, not talk it to death, and figure out what are we going to do and let's <coughs> move forward with it. You know, I'm getting old. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to see something done before I'm gone. Now, would the town be receptive to some form-based code in areas? No idea. Or is that should be a survey question, right? We should have asked that. Uh, in I survey. would say yeah. <laughs> With some kind of description in the question as to what a form-based code is, because yeah, most people wouldn't wouldn't know what that means. We, but we still have to. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. We still got to attract business. For 100 percent. We have one of the highest tax base uh, rates in the in the state. Okay. We get great cops. We get great firemen. Uh, you know, first responders. What else? I was actually in a meeting with Duxbury, and they thought they had the highest tax rate in the state. In well, the Luxbury's in a class by itself. They don't. I'm sorry. Their no taxes no are disrespect a lot lower. to Duxbury, but. To be lower. honest, their taxes are a lot lower. I, was oh, I, I think people, people interchange the term 
tax rate with, with tax bill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Two totally different things. Agree. Bazillion square foot size house gets a bazillion square foot size tax bill. <laughs> I mean, two friends of mine that I that I know and, and see regularly that I used to work with for for over forty years think that taxes in in, in Sharon are obscene, and they're they're both in million plus houses. Exactly. Yeah. But their tax rate is less than ours. Exactly. That's what the point was. They, I think they were like fourteen and change, and I'm like, wait a minute, they're not that high actually. <laughs> Um, well, you have this paper with Rhiannon's email on this. Um, feel free to email her anytime. Um, I'd give you mine if you want it, but everything should probably go through Rhiannon. She'll send it up to me. If you have any questions or you come up with any thoughts that you just want to email and you didn't want to speak out loud or, or came to you when you were doing something else, send them over because we're drafting now, so these last-minute comments will really be helpful in the narrative. So I have a very specific question that, that I, can, I can email to Rhiannon, but I'll, I'll ask you it to begin with. It's one of the questions that I asked in, in the seminar Saturday is that typically when you have an overlay district, and an overlay district is, is, is built to allow some type of use, obviously, but it's, it's defined in a district that's as much that's much la larger rather than the use itself will need because you're not going to you're not trying to tell them exactly where to put it right. you're trying to say put it in this area correct now we've done that and, and our first experience with help from Old Colony Planning Council and, and some pirating from several other communities of their bylaw uh, we adopted an over 25 uh, I'm sorry over 55 bylaw in the town which allowed what we consider very high density small unit single family housing like six units an acre, mm -hmm. over, restricted to over 55 based on what the definition of over 55 is under state law. And, and that, that uh, bylaw has what, what back then under planning, and I still assume today, has what's called a circuit breaker in it. When you hit a certain percent of units in, in relation to the number of units in your town, then the bylaw effectively gets suspended until the number of units in your town increases and then you can, and the intent is to try and make sure that because back then it was extremely lucrative to, to build those <laughs> and we didn't want to see all of the remaining buildable land built with six unit single family over 55 housing on it with, which would end up with 50% of the units in, in town restricted to over 55 housing because that destroys the cross-sectional character of the community. Mm -hmm. So, we're in a similar situation with the MBTA zoning bylaw. We're not trying to dictate, it because we don't have a good way to dictate exactly where to put it. We've been contemplating zoning an area that's, that's roughly four times the minimum area we need to zone, all as part of the MBTA zoning district. Let the developer determine how he wants to build it out and how, where he wants to exactly put buildings. Yeah, that's but, how but, but what we also want to do, based on the requirement that the, the number of units that the town needs is just over 500 based on the percentage that they calculate from the, you know, from the number of housing units in town, mm -hmm. that we want to put some kind of circuit breaker in that says when we hit some number at that number or slightly above, that the, that the overlay isn't available until the number of housing units in the town increases. Yeah, I haven't seen that used any time recently, a circuit breaker. Um, yeah, that's an, that would be, I, mean, I don't know about the, that The one. problem <laughs> we have, if we just limit it to the number of housing units at 15, you know, because it could be 15 units an acre, if we limit it exactly. to just to X, well, 15 times the number of acres to get to 505, exactly then that's, that's never, we'll never get to 505. Because no one in the town of East Bridgewater is going to build in an entire complex of 15 unit per acre housing. I don't think anyone's going to build all of this housing. No, their zone uh, absolutely not. Yeah, no, that's not even going to happen. But, but but that's not the problem we have. The problem we have is is one of trying to go to town meeting and explain to town meeting that if we zone 150 acres under the MPTA district, and as of right, it has to be 15 minimum 15 units an acre. Yeah. People can quickly do the math and say, well, that's like 2,000 units. Exactly. But that doesn't mean they're going to come. And that's 
that's I the, understand that, but there's I no know. there's no way to tell that to town meeting. And there's no way to guarantee that they won't come either. Like well, we you know, like right. you could have a prime real estate opportunity or something, but you know, statistically but yeah, I don't think the only way to give you an out for that, for the circuit breaker idea that you're looking for, would be close monitoring of your units and your SHI. And a lot of times I notice drop that ball. When they get a 40B, they, you know, they have to do it, they approve it, whatever. And then they don't watch those units to make sure they stay on the SHI. And if you don't do your paperwork correctly, they drop off in a year or they drop off in two years depending on how your paperwork is so you really need to monitor your units and when you reach your units where you're you're at your MBTA threshold whatever 2,000 units might be then you know hey I gotta call a town meeting we gotta pull this zoning bylaw we're all at capacity and we're all done up or whatever if that happens except they made that clear at the, at the conference side of the state won't let us do that well, if we tried to do that, the attorney general won't, appro won't approve the bylaw. If you, what do you mean? If you were monitoring it, they wouldn't. If we hit, if we had a number of units, By like, and we wanted to remove the bylaw instead of just having a circuit breaker that says it's on hold until we need more units, we actually wanted to to delete the overlay. But if they were all the built attorney general out, would say we wouldn't no. be able to have any more units because they would all be built. Well, out. In, in the in the session I sat in, there was three representatives from the three state. Boards, one from the Attorney General's office, one from housing, one from whatever the HLC something yeah. or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. They all said that there's no way the Attorney General would let you do that if you already had passed it. Well, because it's passed. That's one thing. But we're talking a different thing of having build out. You know, if it was entirely built out and you were 100% done with MBTA communities. And you well, what's built out? All the land is used or we passed our number of units required? Your, your number of units, I'm assuming. 2,000, whatever the number would happen to be. All right. Yeah, that's the only thing I could tell you is to monitor and make sure. Okay, thank you. <laughs> no problem. Nice to meet you again, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our pleasure. Thank you for Appreciate your time. the information. Talk about 494 North Bedford before I forget what I was going to say about that. <laughs> uh, sure, go ahead. So 494 North Bedford Street is a is a small commercial building that that sits basically in that strip of land between Compass Medical Center and what we formerly knew as the Foxborough Company. Oh. Uh, there's a, a cabinet a cabinet retailer in there. There, there was a, used to be a gift shop in there. There used yeah, to the be cleaners. A, cleaners. Oh, yeah. Cleaners was in there. Uh, there was at one point, I think, a fourth business, or maybe it was three businesses in an office on the second floor. In any case, it, it came to the attention of the, there's an application right now for an apartment to be put in there, i.e. residential use. Okay. Uh, it came to the attention of the planning board back in, in the 2014 to 2015, 2016 time frame when uh, Ed Gardner was a building inspector who was either just retired or within a week or two of retiring. Uh, there was already an apartment there that had been built, mm. technically speaking, in violation of zoning. We were unable to put a date on when that apartment was built. Mm -hmm. So one of the difficulties in zoning is you run into that look back time, which depending on exactly when it was is either seven or 10 years. It, it varies depending on what the specific issue is. But in any case, although we could have argued that the apartment was built illegally since there was nothing in our, our folders about it, uh, it would have turned into a messy, probably into a court case. Mm. So maybe against the better judgment now that we look at it in the longer term, a special permit was granted to make that apartment legal. Uh -huh. The applicant has now come back and, and filed for a special permit application for what amounts to a second apartment, which would now uh, effectively, from a, from a land use law standpoint, turn that into a multifamily building. Mm. Uh, he doesn't qualify for any of the sections of the zoning bylaw for a second special permit. So what I was going to do tonight, and I'll do right now, is I'll put a motion on the table uh, 
letting the applicant know that he has a right to file for the special uh, a special permit because anyone can file for a special permit. But we would suggest that he withdraw his, his application because we're not going to be allowed to approve that special permit since there is no section of bylaw he can cite that would allow us to do that. Mm -hmm. That's a motion by Mr. Gardner uh, to notify uh, the owner at 494 uh, North Bedford Street uh, of the um, belief that there is not an ability to grant a special permit at this time uh, and to suggest his uh, withdrawal um, assuming he's not willing to do that I will schedule a hearing and I, I think based on on a, a fairly lengthy discussion I had with the uh, with the uh, uh, building commissioner this morning his feeling is I tend to agree with him that anybody has a right to apply for a special permit mm -hmm. uh, they have to make the case before the special permit granting authority that their use is similar to one of the other uses now he's in the industrial zone all the all the allowed uses in the industrial zone are clearly industrial uses right. uh, there, there's never been any conflict in definition between commercially zoned property and residentially zoned pr property that's that's one of the bright lines in zoning in Massachusetts uh -huh. uh, so that there's never been an issue there but but the, the catch-22 here I believe is that uh, it's his job to make the presentation before the permit the special permit granting authority that this is why he feels he has a right to the special permit so Technically speaking, I don't think we have a legal right to prejudge that, even though we basically know because of prior experience at that site. Uh, and to fix a potential long-running legal issue that we had granted him a special permit before, he was made aware at that time that, that he was only given it because we couldn't determine whether or not the, the, the apartment existed long-term, even though we know it could have existed seven to ten years, but we knew it wasn't much longer than that. Mm. So, I mean, that's the basis. And, and the other part of the motion is it's, in, in my view, it's unfair to not tell him ahead of time that if he's going to pay the money to get all of that done, including all of the legal advertising and so forth, that uh, he should know that it's almost guaranteed that we have to vote the special permit down because the section he cited is a, well, and the zone doesn't allow for special permits that's, unless it's similar to one of the allowed uses. I understand. So let's raise that. Feel free if you will. Um, <laughs> How, however you would prefer to phrase that. Well, I, I, I <coughs> you know. If, if you want to leave that alone and just get to the point where we have to say no at the hearing, I have no issue with that. I just, yeah, I, I mean, just I, felt it was appropriate to let him know ahead of time. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, and, and I think your, your point regarding, you know, the idea of prejudging something is, is well taken as well. Um, but um, you want me to change the motion to say we're going to decline to accept the application? No. Okay. No. I, I didn't no. think you wanted that. I want to go there. Yeah. Okay. Um, So, you know, I think we would advise him of the scheduling of a public hearing, but that, you know, be aware of Section 5K2, uh, I believe it is. Be aware of the, be aware of the fact that it's his responsibility to demonstrate that the use he's proposing is similar to one of the allowed uses in sure. the district? Fair enough. Okay. So that's, that's the motion then to, to mm -hmm. schedule the public hearing, uh, the next available date, and then uh, to uh, uh, <coughs> likewise advise the applicant of his responsibilities uh, under, the, uh, under the applicable provision of the zoning bylaws. Is there a second in that motion? Second. Seconded by Ms. Phillips, motion made by Mr. Gardner. Any further discussion there? No. Hearing none. All in favor of that motion, so signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, that's the unanimous vote of all uh, members 
present. Mm -hmm. um, so, Ellen, that would be the 6th, Ellen? 6th of May? Is that right? Assuming they want to go forward, that would uh, set that for whatever time, 7.15 or later, and go from there. Um, I think the only other thing on the agenda tonight, uh, there is a letter in the file uh, with respect to 600 uh, North Bedford Street, and that is the former Compass Medical Center, and that is just to notify the board and uh, the town that effective on uh, April 1st, uh, Compass Way will uh, no longer be used as a um, uh, name for the, the access. Uh, it will become Donald's Way. Do we know uh, who Donald is? Just for the rooms. I, <laughs> that, that, I get into that at this meeting. <laughs> Donald's Way, uh, and that uh, is, is just for informational purposes only. Okay. I don't believe that they need any kind of a formal vote of this board. Uh, where the, the legal uh, street address there is 600 North Bedford Street and um, the, uh, uh, you know, the Compass Way or Donald's Way is simply a, a familiar name, if you will, uh, that's used. Um, I don't think there are any other updates or matters that need to be discussed tonight. Um, and unless somebody has something... Uh, I will uh, entertain a, a motion at this time. Oh, two, two real quick things, sure. and then, we'll, then okay. I'll, I'll make a motion. Uh, yep. First thing is that I've, I've, I've pretty much boiled down the section I want to add at the end of the uh, uh, fail to pay taxes uh, town bylaw. Oh, oh yeah, right. And, and that's that's going to be that that uh, basically one additional paragraph that says that that there's a it'll be legal legally worded, but the, the waiver process will be through to the uh, selectmen. And that it'll be based on the waiver being granted to either senior citizens and or financial hardship. Yeah. So that the necessary repairs through uh, multiple uh, licensing issue issuing departments, and they primarily be the billing department, the billing permits, and the Board of Health or Title V systems. So that they they won't negatively impact the market potential marketability or livability of a piece of property, uh, and and therefore in, increase the hardship that the owner has who already has a hardship because they're financially unable to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I've looked at some other towns that have some other requirements in their bylaw, but I think we want to leave up to the selectmen how they want to determine whether there's actually a hardship there. Uh, I don't see any way to, to put down into the bylaw itself how you would document that. I, I, I think it should be it should left up to the to the authority that's going to determine whether or not they're going to grant a waiver. The, the main problem I have right now is that there is no language within the bylaw that would allow a waiver to be granted of the process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think the bylaw right now is flawed because the state law says in arrears of 12 months or more, mm -hmm. at some point in time, in, in time the, the town deemed it appropriate to... Uh, to change that to in arrears of 30 days or more, Ooh, mm -hmm. uh, even though the enabling legislation has a specific timeline in it. Uh, I, I remember this discussion before that we had on this issue. Yeah. Yes. That's one of the planned bylaws to, to go to annual town meeting or revisions. It's not actually a zoning bylaw, it's a town bylaw. But mm -hmm. one, other, one other quick piece of information that I will have some pretty final stuff by I, I hate to say April 1st, but <laughs> April 1st April. For, the, for the MBTA zoning district. But a, a bit of information that I picked up after the sessions in at Holy Cross with the citizens planning, training, consortium, or whatever that is, CPTC. C yeah. CPTC. Uh, one of the things they raised, and I hadn't thought, although I know it, I hadn't thought about it all that much, and they were trying to come up with, with in, the, in the MBTA district seminars, uh, tools to present things to town meeting uh, one of the things is and I have an actual fairly fairly decent slide so show that we'll have for the presentations but that slide shows sh clearly shows that there's virtually no one-for-one uh, -one impact uh, or negative impact with additional multifamily housing going into any community mm. in fact 
single family homes have more uh, school age children than multifamily housing does, even three and four bedroom multifamily housing. Hmm. The other thing that they raised is that almost all of the towns in, in eastern Massachusetts and all of the towns in southeastern Massachusetts, with just a couple of exceptions, have had decreasing, uh, decreasing enrollment since the late 1900s. Oh, that is for sure. So, yeah. yesterday in, in my idle time, I, I quickly jumped on the computer and, and found through one of the zillions of links that are available at that C CPTC site, uh, the school enrollments for the whole state of Massachusetts. So I quickly pulled off, and I haven't quite finished it, but I started at 2002 and 2003, which is the oldest audited enrollment numbers they have. Mm, mm. In, in 2002, 2003, we were just under 2,500 students. Uh, as of 2023, 24, we have just about 2,000. So it's gone from 2,500 to 2,000 over that 20-year span, huh. despite the fact that the population in town has increased by about 40%. Hmm. And the number of housing units in town has gone up by about 20%. Hmm. So, so there's, there's pretty clear evidence right in our own town that there's, there's absolutely no direct relationship. Yeah. How society grows is, is I don't want to say totally independent of housing because you, you can't say that, but is, is, is very disconnected from how fast housing grows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's far more a society-based thing. Not, mm -hmm. It's not... Mm -hmm. Not the housing yeah. market. Smaller households, smaller and fewer children. Yeah. Well, that seems to be what the, the yeah. numbers say, and the numbers don't yeah. lie. That's the; these are audited numbers from each town. Each town is required under the state law to to submit those numbers October first, which is which is theoretically the date that all your school enrollments are, are more than completed. Uh -huh. uh, so that number just, just went in late last year for this year. 2008 is the specific number. Yeah. But it hit just, just 2,500, it hit in uh, 2004. And it was basically the same for the first four years. 2468, 2422, 2501, 2522, and then it's been going down since then. So that's one of the things that we'll have as part of our uh, presentation the plan is going to be and it's probably going to be the, the second meeting in May what I was planning on doing is is making the public presentation first here before the planning board okay. so that everyone here on the board can uh, critique and come up with the type of questions that the, the public might ask when we present it later it's probably like the high school auditorium or something like that mm -hmm. yeah. okay so, so given that, I'll make a motion that we uh, adjourn. I'll second that one. <laughs> that is made and seconded to adjourn the meeting at uh, 8.25. Uh, all in favor of that motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The meeting is adjourned. Oh, oh.